Well, I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm, and welcome to the ACP Adult Immunization Clinical Update. I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer. This is Bob Hopkins. And this is Bill Schaffner. And we're all members of the ACP Technical uh, Advisory Committee. And we're going to be doing this presentation today. Now, this is what we have set up for the next hour. First, we're going to do a little intro, and then we're going to talk about all these different vaccines throughout the morning. A little bit about me. I'm a practicing general internist in Atlanta. I'm a past president of the college. Uh, I'm an associate professor of medicine at Emory, and I'm one of the liaisons for ACIP. And I'm also a member of the, adult, the ACP Adult Immunization Committee. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I hope as you walked in, each of you picked up a copy of this adult schedule. You might want to refer to it during the talk. There's some wonderful footnotes on the back. Unfortunately, this is a smaller version, a pocket version, and you might need to get a magnifying glass to read some of it, or at least some really nice reading glasses, but it's a great resource. So the, uh, the adult schedule is put together each year by the ACIP the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And this organization meets three times a year. There are 15 voting members that are selected by the HHS Secretary. And this is the group that makes routine recommendations for adults and children for uh, immunization. And as of October 2012, this process is evidence-based. They use a grade approach. Now, this is the only entity in the federal government that makes these kinds of recommendations. And once the recommendations are made, they're reviewed by the, the CDC director, and they do not become official until they're published in the, in the MMWR. Now, one of the things you're going to note throughout the morning is the ACIP recommendations often differ from what's recommended by the FDA. And we'll point that out uh, for each of the vaccine recommendations that's different. Um, ACIP website has some great resources. You can uh, easily look up the uh, statements for each of the vaccines. There are also vaccine information sheets. I downloaded all these, put them in plastic in a notebook in my office, and when I talk to a patient about a vaccine, I hand them the notebook, let them look at it, go to something else, come back, and... Usually they don't have any questions. They're really good, and I encourage you to, to download those and share them with your patients. Now, there are two schedules. There's a children and adolescent schedule uh, for those through age 18, and the adult schedule that starts at age 19 and older, and that's going to be the one that we're going to be focusing on today. So the uh, schedule was published in the February 4th Annals of Internal Medicine. And just to give you a little heads up, ACP is very involved in, in shaping national vaccine policy. We have representation at all the ACIP meetings and on many of the working groups. We also have a, a very robust web presence. We have an adult immunization portal. We have a guide to adult immunization. And we have our own app. So I encourage you to download that, and it's an easy way to you know, plug in some information about patients and, and a little cheat sheet on which immunizations that they need. And here's a list of all the vaccines um, that the schedule talks about for adults. Let's begin with the little clinical vignette. This is Mrs. M. She's 23 years old, and you're asked by her OBGYN uh, to, con to do a consultation for her asthma. She's 24 weeks pregnant. She's there with her mother, mother-in-law, and husband. Immunizations, she had a meningococcal vaccine prior to college. She had a Tdap at age 21. She's also had two doses of the HPV vaccine. What immunization recommendations would you make? And it happens to be November. So as you think about that, we're going to do a little audience response quiz. So does everybody have their little clicker? Get ready. Which answer best describes which adults need Tdap booster? Response one, parents of infants. Response two, adults age 65 and older. And number three, all adults. Okay. <laughs> Yes, 
That's right. All adults need a Tdap booster. So y'all can all go home. You know this stuff, right? Well, this is who we're trying to protect, little babies. And over the last 10 years, there's been a surge in pertussis uh, pertussis uh, related deaths in infants and what we want to do is surround these little babies in a cocoon of protection believe it or not household members are to blame for 83 percent of transmission to these infants just a little history about the the pertussis vaccine it first became av available in 1914 but it wasn't until the 1940s that it was routinely recommended and by 1997 the acellular DTAP was was used in the entire kids vaccine series and then in 2005 we had the Tdap booster for adolescents and adults and their two products are available so who needs Tdap adolescents need a Tdap booster dads need a one-time Tdap booster grandparents need a one-time Tdap booster and in February of 2012 we actually the ACIP made Tdap booster universal for all adults and what they found by reviewing the data is adults age 65 and older had higher hospital rates than those age 19 to 64 and that's why they expanded a Tdap booster to all adults age 65 and older not just those that have close contact with an infant so all adults need to have a Tdap booster now pregnancy Pregnant women need a Tdap in each and every pregnancy in the late third trimester between the between 27 and 36 weeks. And the reason why we want to do it late in pregnancy is that way mom's antibodies will be passed on to baby and will help prevent infant, infant pertussis. Now this is an off-label use. There are two products that are available and you note the age indications. Um, concerning if you're giving it to adults age 65 if you don't happen to have the right one in your refrigerator. Well, ACIP guidance says vaccinating with either product is preferable to missing a vaccination opportunity. Now, currently only a single booster of Tdap is recommended except for pregnant women need one in each and every pregnancy. And again, multiple Tdap boosters is an off-label use. Another concern, and this was presented at the June 2013 ACIP meeting. You know, we've seen pertussis. Every time we pick up a newspaper, it seems like there's a pertussis um, of infection resurgence somewhere. So what they found is the Tdap effectiveness is 75% in the first year, and over the next two to four years, effectiveness wanes. So just keep this in mind, and I encourage you, every year when this new schedule comes out, Next year, I would probably check the Tdap to see if the recommendations have changed. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about the HPV vaccine. Let's start with the pretest. HPV vaccination is recommended by ACIP for which groups? All females age 11 to 26, and all males age 11 to 26, or number two, all females 11 to 26, and all males age 11 to 21. Laura Lee, did you pick out this music? <laughs> well, the 55% is right. This is a little tricky, and I'll explain why. There are two HPV vaccines currently available. There's a quadrivalent vaccine that covers 6, 11, 16, and 18, and a bivalent vaccine that covers 16 and 18. Now, that is a typo in your handout. Um, in the handout that's on the, the web, I put 611, but it's the HPV2 covers type 16 and 18. Now, the recommendation is three doses over six months. Females can use either the quadrivalent or the bivalent. For males, the quadrivalent is recommended. All right, so for both males and females, you start vaccinating at age 11 or 12, or as early as age 9. And for females, catch up through age 26 for all females. And that, so that's really what we internists are going to be doing. We're going to be doing the catch up to make sure all these young women are protected. For males, all males age up through age 21 should be vaccinated. Age 22 to 26 may be vaccinated. 
The recommendation um, is all males that have, that have sex with other males or immunocompromised males, they should be vaccinated through 26. So it's a routine for males aged through age 21, and then also this extra subset of immunocompromised males and, and MSMs through age 26. So the HPV vaccine is the first ever cervical ca ca cancer vaccine. This was the first patient in my practice um, who was vaccinated. And this is the first male in my practice that was vaccinated. And this is a picture of this pesky little virus. And this is what we're trying to pr prevent. Invasive cervical cancer, genital warts, more genital warts, anal cancer. There are over 100 different strains of HPV virus. Six and 11 cause genital warts and recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. HPV types 16 and 18 are linked to 70% of all cases of cervical cancer, vaginal and vulvar cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, penile cancer, and anal cancer in both men and women. And the low risk viruses, including 611, also cause some abnormal pap smears. So in your handout that's on the web, I gave you some additional slides about HPV and anal cancer. We don't have time to review those, but I encourage you to look at them because it's the information out there is very impressive. Uh, there are also some extra slides about HPV and oral pharyngeal cancer, so I encourage you to take a look at those. But I want to emphasize the cancer-preventing potential of the HPV vaccine. Um, this is, was published in MMWR. It's data from MPCR and SEER. And of the more than 33,000 cancers that occur each year in the United States at anatomic sites associated with HPV, about 26,000 can be attributed to HPV and might be preventable through use of the HPV vaccine. So this shows some of those numbers for women. This slide shows some of those numbers for men. But this vaccine has the potential to do so much to protect our patients. So one of the questions you might be asked by your patients, by maybe moms and dads, is why do you have to start vaccinating at such a young age? Well, the vaccination prevents infection. This is a prophylactic vaccine. It doesn't treat infection. And when you're young, let's face it, your immune system is very robust. And so this allows time for optimal antibody response to the vaccine. And it works best if given before exposure to the HPV virus, which usually occurs at the onset of sexual activity. As a parent, I hate this slide because it's a reminder just how young some young people start having sex. But it's, it's true. So we want to really make sure that these young people get their vaccination at age 11 to 12. So, so talk to those parents and grandparents when you're in, in, they're in the exam room with you. Uh, another point about dosing, um, three doses over six months, and this slide gives the minimum time period between each individual dose. So you want to make sure that they're spread out over the six months. So possible side effects, very important. Most of it's just local side effects, but a lot of times we're giving these to younger people, and let's, you know, they don't like to get shots. There's a lot of drama. And so um, what they found is there were a lot of vasovagal reactions. So you do want to make sure that you observe the patients um, uh, for 20 minutes, 15 minutes after administration. Um, HPV vaccine uh, should not be given to anyone that has an immediate hypersensitivity to yeast or any vaccine component. It doesn't interfere with hormonal contraceptive. It's not going to work as well if the patients have immune system problems or, or, or if they're on immunosuppressive medications. It's not recommended for use in pregnancy. However, so far, there have been no out adverse outcomes up during pregnancy and no adverse events in the developing fetus. However, if they're pregnant, you want to delay vaccination until after delivery. Okay, a few, a quick, a few quick FAQs. Can you get HPV infection from the vaccine? No, the vaccine does not contain any viral DNA. So there's no way you can get infected uh, with the virus by getting the vaccine. Do you have to get a pregnancy test before giving the vaccine? No, but you shouldn't give it to women that are pregnant or planning to become pregnant really soon. Can you uh, receive the vaccine if you're nursing? ACP, ACIP says yes. Can it be used to treat an abnormal pap smear? No, this is not a treatment for HPV infection or HPV related disease. Do you still have to get cervical cancer screening if you get the HPV vaccine? Yes, 
HPV vaccines are prophylactic vaccines. They work best if given before exposure to the virus, and women must still get regular cervical cancer screening, which now should not begin until age 21. So these were the, the first patients that received um, the HPV vaccine in my practice. They are my children, my boy girl twins. There they are at 16, and now they're 24. And this is uh, one of the daughter of one of my patients, Pam Carpenter, at age 16. Um, this is Pam when she was 19. And this is Pam when she was 48. And she died a year later of invasive cervical cancer. And I promised her mother that whenever I talked about HPV vaccine, I would mention um, Pam to help you put a face on the how, just how much good getting this vaccine can do. So a recap, um, we, you got both of these questions right, so I don't think we need to go back and review those. But let's go back to our little vignette. Mrs. M, um, the, who's 23 years old, 24 weeks pregnant, and has asthma. So it's November. Um, we don't, we're not going to use the clickers for this. Why don't we use hands? Who thinks she needs a flu shot? Yeah. And um, would you give the, um, the flu mist? No, because it's a, a live attenuated vaccine. You would get the flu shot, and we'll, you'll hear more about that later. Um, she doesn't need Hep A or Hep B. Would you give her another HPV vaccine? She's only had two doses. Would you give that now? No, you'd wait till after she has after she delivers. Uh, it'd be great to give it before she leaves the hospital, but but certainly if that doesn't work, you know, just make sure she has an appointment for when she comes back into your office to get that third vaccine. Um, she got her meningococcal booster at age 21, so she's fine with that. Um, she got her Tdap booster at age 21. She's 24 weeks pregnant, so she would need another Tdap. Remember, you get the Tdap in each and every pregnancy between week 27 and 36. And um, I've got one more. I've got one minute and 40 seconds. And so let's spend just a few seconds talking about all these family members that she brought in. Because when, when you see this lady, you know, you're thinking about the patient, but you're also thinking about that little baby and what you can do to protect that baby once it's born. So the husband um, is 47, diabetic, smokes, and has an egg allergy. Um, so you can, um, and this is something we'll talk, you'll hear about later. Uh, he has a hives only egg allergy, so he just, he will be able to get a flu shot. Uh, he can get the inactivated shot. He also will need a Tdap. And since he's diabetic, he'll need a hepatitis B. And since he's a smoker, he should also get a pneumonia shot, a pneumococcal vaccine. Um, her mother is 59 and healthy. She also needs a flu shot. She also needs a Tdap. Um, the mother-in-law is 67 and healthy. She also needs a flu shot. She needs a Tdap. And since she's over um, 65 and has not yet had a, a pneumococcal vaccination, she will need that. And she also should be vaccinated for shingles. And there's also a little stepson who hasn't seen the doctor in a long time. Want to make sure he gets a flu shot, gets his Tdap, and three doses of HPV over six months. All right, I've got 22 seconds left. So we're going to pass it over to, to Bob, and here you go. And you were going to help us change the slides. Well, good morning. To save a couple of moments, I'll tell you that I have no disclosures other than my non-financial conflict of interest that I'm a firm believer in adult vaccination. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Well, good morning. I'm going to continue on Sandy's trend and talk about uh, some of these important uh, adult immunizations. I'm going to focus my comments on immunization for bacterial disease. And so I'm going to talk about pneumococcal vaccination, vaccination against Haemophilus influenza B, and against meningococcus. And I'm going to start us off again with an audience response uh, question. So which of the following adults should receive both pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and pneumococcal polysaccharide? Patient one, a 35-year-old man with sickle cell disease. 
Patient two, a 65-year-old woman with diabetes who lives in a nursing home. Patient three, a 22-year-old woman with HIV on antiretrovirals. Patient four, a 42-year-old man with chronic hep C. Question number five, patients one and three only. Or number six, all of these patients need both pneumococcal vaccines. Please make your selection on your clickers now. Okay. Um, the majority chose six. Actually, the correct answer is five. And the, the thought process is patients two and four are at increased risk for pneumococcal disease, but they're not in the groups at highest risk. So we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about why you choose combination vaccination as opposed to just the polysaccharide. So pneumococcal immunization has been recommended for adults at increased risk for invasive pneumococcal disease. An invasive pneumococcal disease needs pneumococcal meningitis, bacteremia, and sepsis. The two vaccines we have available, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which we've used in all children since 2010, has different recommendations from the ACIP and FDA licensure. The pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine has been available since the 1980s and is what most of us were raised on uh, as far as pneumococcal vaccination for our adults. This slide just gives you a visual to think about the vast majority of invasive pneumococcal disease occurs in our adult patients, ages 45 and older. And to even break it down further, if you think about adults with invasive pneumococcal disease, <clears throat> in adults 18 to 64, the incidence is fairly low, 3.8 cases per 100,000. In those who've got hematologic malignancies, 186 per 100,000, so a dramatic increase. Adults with HIV, also a very high rate. And then in this age 65 and above population, it's about 10 times the incidence in our younger adults. So there is a differential risk for invasive disease in the, this adult population. So to talk a little bit more about the vaccines themselves, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine is a purified capsular polysaccharide contains the 23 types of pneumococcus that cause almost 90% of bacteremic pneumococcal disease. It's not proven to prevent all-cause pneumonia, but is very effective against invasive disease. Immunity lasts at least five years following a single dose, and really local reactions are the only common adverse event with this vaccine. The pneumococcal conjugate, the seven-valent vaccine, was used for many years and was replaced by the 13-valent in 2010. In December of 2011, the FDA approved it for adult use in patients over age 50 to prevent pneumonia and invasive pneumococcal disease based on studies of immunogenicity and safety. And in June of 2012, the ACIP recommended pneumococcal conjugate for invasive pneumococcal disease prevention in the highest risk adult groups. So slightly different from the FDA recommendation. Best practice if you're using the conjugate is to give it prior to using the polysaccharide vaccine. So this cartoon is kind of how I conceptualize this. Patients at average risk, so young, pa young adults less than 65, those without chronic medical conditions, don't need pneumococcal vaccine. Those at increased risk, so those 65 plus smokers and those with chronic medical conditions which are not immune compromised, need polysaccharide. Those who are highest risk, immune compromised and those with anatomic risk, need a combination of the conjugate and the polysaccharide vaccine. So we're not going to talk about the, lowest, the lower risk group. So the increased risk group, those who smoke, those who have chronic conditions such as diabetes, lung disease, asthma and COPD, cardiovascular disease, liver disease and kidney disease, except for those who have end-stage renal disease and nephrotic syndrome, all of these patients, in addition to our adults 65 and older, need pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine only. If you vaccinate these patients before age 65, they'll need a second dose after age 65. Those vaccinated at 65 do not need a booster dose of vaccine. To turn to our highest risk group, this includes a number of groups. Those who have cancer, including solid tumors, hematologic malignancies and multiple myeloma, patients with HIV, patients with inherited and acquired immune deficiencies, 
end-stage kidney disease and nephrotic syndrome, patients that we're treating with steroids, biologic immunomodulators or other immune suppressants, patients who receive transplants, patients who have asplenia either anatomic, those that have had splenectomy, and functional spleen dysfunction, as well as those who have CSF leak and cochlear implants. These patients are at highest risk and need the conjugate vaccine followed by the polysaccharide vaccine. So increased risk patients, polysaccharide now, booster if they're vaccinated before age 65. Highest risk group, if they've received no prior pneumococcal polysaccharide, you give the conjugate, followed eight weeks later by polysaccharide, and then you boost with the polysaccharide. Patients who previously had the polysaccharide vaccine, you give the conjugate at least a year after the polysaccharide, and then follow up with polysaccharide booster doses as above. And the reason for the delay if they previously received polysaccharide is you don't want to have reduction in immunity because of an interference phenomenon. Now, let's turn our attention to the other bacterial vaccines and pull out your audience response keypads again. Which of the following are medical indications for vaccination of adults against Haemophilus influenza type B and meningococcus? Choice one, asplenia or splenectomy. Choice two, HIV. Choice three, solid organ transplants. Choice four, cancer chemotherapy. Or choice five, all of these are reasons. Please select. Okay, the vast majority chose choice five. And the correct answer is actually choice one, asplenia and splenectomy. The only indications for Haemophilus influenza B vaccination in adults are anatomic and functional asplenia and following stem cell transplants. Neither of these vaccines is routinely indicated in patients with HIV or prior to or doing chemotherapy. So that was a little tricky because Hib vaccination is one that's just been recommended for the first time in adults. So we'll talk first about meningococcal vaccine and then turn to Hib. Meningococcal vaccine is recommended in all of our children aged 11 to 12 and then a booster dose prior to college. The vaccination recommendations for adults are selective based on risk, which I'll go over with more detail in the next slide. We currently have three vaccines licensed in this country. They all cover the A, C, Y, and W135 strains. There's not currently a type B vaccine available in this country. The polysaccharide vaccine is given subcutaneously. It's been available since the 1970s and is the preferred vaccine for vaccinating older adults over 56. The conjugate vaccine, there are two products available now, are preferred in patients who are younger and those who are likely to need revaccination. And boosters can be given selectively after five years in patients who have risk that persists long term. The indications for meningococcal vaccine, as I mentioned, college uh, freshmen who are going to live in a dormitory, patients who have asplenia. And if you have the opportunity to vaccinate prior to splenectomy, that's going to give you the best response and the best protection for your patient. Persons who have complement deficiencies. Travelers who are going to at-risk areas such as Sub-Saharan Africa in December to June. Microbiologists who are going to potentially be exposed to meningococcus in the laboratory. And then revaccination is recommended in those that have ongoing risk. HIV was an indication for meningococcal vaccination prior to this year's schedule, and the ACIP has removed meningococcal recommendation in this year because the incidence of meningococcal disease is very low in the HIV population. Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine is recommended in all of our children, three to four doses depending on the product used. The adult recommendations are new for this year. It's recommended in patients who've had a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. They get a three dose series, six to 12 months following the transplant with doses separated by four weeks, regardless of their prior vaccination history. The reason for this recommendation is that these patients essentially have an immunologic clean slate. They're starting over again. And so they need protection against Haemophilus influenza disease that we would be giving in childhood. HIV vaccine is not routinely recommended in HIV because of low absolute risk. And it is recommended prior to splenectomy 
or in patients who have splenic dysfunction with one dose if they're not previously vaccinated. And again, if it can be given two weeks prior to splenectomy, that's ideal. To think about patients that we may see in our internal medicine practices, many of us do perioperative consultations in the hospital, and so it's important to think about meningococcal, HIV, and pneumococcal vaccination prior to splenectomy. If you're consulted on someone prior to a cochlear implant, they need to have pneumococcal conjugate vaccine followed by polysaccharide vaccine. Hospitalized medical patients should certainly get influenza vaccination in season and pneumococcal vaccination all year round. And then Tdap and influenza vaccination are certainly important in women prior to leaving the hospital uh, after having a baby. And there have been a lot of pilot projects done thinking about vaccinating the entire family prior to sending home a newborn infant. Immune compromise, what does that mean? Well, patients who are on prednisone 20 milligrams a day are equivalent. Patients with HIV with a CD4 count of under 200, any of our patients on biologic immunomodulators. All of these patients need maximal non-live virus vaccination. So not necessarily MMR, varicella, and zoster vaccine, but they need all of these other vaccines that Sandy and I have talked about today. There are not recommendations for live virus vaccines in these immune compromised patients. And as much as we'd like to talk about travel vaccination also, that's another entire uh, weekend seminar, uh, and the CDC Yellow Book covers that very effectively. And then finally, I'm going to just give you one slide talking or about a couple of other vaccines we're not going to cover heavily today. Varicella and zoster vaccines are both made from the same strain of virus, but varicella has a much lower quantity of the virus in the vaccine than the zoster vaccine does, so they're not interchangeable. Now, varicella and MMR, which we think of as childhood vaccines, are typically most useful in children, but they do have recommendations in adults, and the groups include healthcare workers, those who work in institutions, education and daycare. We worry about these diseases in women who may have children, and so we want them vaccinated prior to pregnancy, and they also can be issues around international travel and adoptions. They should not be given with severe immune compromise or during acute illness, and we ideally want to give them away from pregnancy. And then finally, hepatitis A vaccination has been recommended in all of our children since 2007. The adult recommendation is selective. It's for adults who have chronic liver disease, men who have sex with men, injection drug users, travelers, recipients of clotting factors, and laboratory workers. This vaccine is given as two doses, if the completion of the series is delayed, you don't need to start over, but typically you're going to give doses initially and then at six months later. You can also give the combination vaccine with hepatitis A and B in it. And I'm going to now turn things over to Dr. Schaffner to bring us home and talk about some additional adult vaccines. Thanks, Bob. Oh. Oh, you ran out. Okay. Oh, if you stop by the ACP booth, you can. If you stop by the ACP booth, they they can give you a printout because it's just really handy to have in each of your exam rooms. So good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Schaffner. I'm an infectious disease doc at Vanderbilt. These are my disclosures. For Merck, I'm a member of a data safety monitoring board that deals with uh, studies of experimental vaccines. And over the past year, I've given one lecture on behalf of Sanofi Pasteur. So we'll talk this morning about hepatitis B vaccine, shingles vaccine, and of course, influenza vaccine. We can't talk about adult immunizations without mentioning influenza. So there's, there have been some remarkable changes that have occurred in the epidemiology of hepatitis B in the United States because we have immunized children so successfully, and you can see that rates have plummeted down in that age group, and also because we have so comprehensively immunized healthcare workers. Hepatitis B used to be a risk of our occupational exposure because we 
have immunized ourselves and our students of all the healthcare professions, hepatitis B acquired at work it has virtually disappeared in the United States. That being said, as you can see, there are still substantial rates of hepatitis B occurring in the adult population. So the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends hepatitis B immunization for a whole series of people who meet either behavioral or occupational characteristics. Healthcare workers, as we've just mentioned, people who have chronic liver disease, they're not more apt to get hepatitis B than you and me, but if they get it, it's colossal. It really leads to severe liver failure. That's why you immunize those people. People with HIV infection, they're more apt to acquire it. People with end-stage renal disease, because they also are more apt to acquire it. Public safety workers, they're in the same category as healthcare workers because they are more apt to have blood and body fluid exposures during the course of their work. Injection drug users, that's obvious. Patients, any patient who is evaluated for a sexually transmitted disease, that's obviously someone already who is exposing themselves more than average to the possibility of acquiring hepatitis B. And then sex partners and household contacts of people who are known to be hepatitis B surface antigen positive. Obviously, that familial uh, and often spousal in intimacy exposes the still susceptible person to the risk of transmission, so we immunize them in order to protect them. And then there's one other recommendation. That's usually whispered. It's not mentioned nearly as prominently, but I'm going to mention it prominently now. Hepatitis B immunization is recommended for all sexually active persons who are not in a long-term, mutually monogamous relationship with a hepatitis B surface antigen negative partner. Now, first of all, monogamous is a word that doesn't take a modifier, like usually, or when I'm in town. You is, you is either monogamous or you ain't. So this is a mutually monogamous relationship. If you think about sexually active persons who are not in a long-term mutually monogamous relationship, that's a lot of adults. They should all be immunized against hepatitis B. In addition, relatively newly as of December 2011, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices made another recommendation which is also not yet penetrant. It's not that well known. It seems that, actually surprising to me, adults with diabetes have a greater risk of HBV infection, hepatitis B infection, than non-diabetics in every age group. And that likely has to do if you look at it on a population basis with sharing of glucose testing equipment, whether it occurs in, usually in healthcare facilities. So the recommendation is as follows. Hepatitis B vaccine should be given to all unvaccinated adults with diabetes age 19 through 59. Woo. That's a lot of folks in your practices. HBV vaccine may be, may be given to adults with diabetes older than age 60 at a physician's discretion. Why the distinction? Because over age 60, the hepatitis B vaccine is not as effective, and so the cost-effectiveness calculations that the ACIP made said, okay, will recommend it comprehensively up to age 60, above it's at your discretion. And what would that discretion entail? If they are in an assisted living 
nursing home, or other communal living facility where there is glucose monitoring with glucometers that may not be optimally disinfected between every patient. So that would determine whether I would give someone over age 60 hepatitis B vaccine who's diabetic. So those two recommendations for sexually active adults who are not mon monogamous and all diabetics, I think probably for virtually everyone in this room, that really opens the proverbial accordion of folks in your practice who ought to be immunized against hepatitis B. A word or two about shingles vaccine, herpes zoster. Herpes zoster causes about a million, uh, occurs about a million times each year. The lifetime risk is 30 to 50 percent and increases with age. And as we all know, post-herpetic neuralgia, post-shingles pain can be debilitating and occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of cases, also increasing with age. Zoster vaccine is the same, as Bob has said, as live attenuated varicella vaccine, except in a much larger dose. The recommendation is that a single dose should be given for all adults 60 years of age or older, unless they are notably immunocompromised. You don't have to take a history about chickenpox. They don't need a history of chickenpox. Lots of us don't remember having ch had chickenpox if you were born and raised in the United States. The serologic data indicate over 95% of us have had exposure to the chickenpox virus in the past. So you don't have to deal with the chickenpox history. And there's no need to do a varicella titer to decide whether or not somebody should get shingles vaccine. If you're 60 or older, if you're not notably immunocompromised, they get immunized. If they've had a previous history of zoster, you can wait a year. And the vaccine's efficacy is such that it reduced the occurrence of zoster by about 60%, and it reduced post-herpetic neuralgia by about 66%. Not perfect, but nonetheless a very substantial effect. Now, most frequently asked question. The FDA recently licensed uh, Zoster vaccine for everyone age 50 and older. So why is it that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices hasn't said, oh yes, start immunizing at age 50? First, once immunized, you get an antibody rise, which then begins to wane. But there's very little information on re-immunization and its effectiveness. If we re-immunize, do you get an antibody boost, and how high does it go? At the moment, the data are sparse, but you, don't, you certainly don't get a big boost. You get a slight increase. So at the moment, the data are such that it looks as though we have one bullet in this proverbial gun. So the question is when to fire it. If you fire it at age 50, your patient may be less optimally protected after age 65 and 70 when the increase in shingles really goes up. So the ACIP struggled with this and decided to stick at the moment with the recommendation at age 60 because that immediately precedes the age group of greatest risk. We all know that there's one other problem with shingles vaccine, namely for folks age 65 and older. Yes, it's covered under Medicare, but under Part D, the prescription drug benefit, which raises a whole series of complications we, which we can discuss during the Q&A if you like. But basically at Vanderbilt, our physicians either instruct their patients or either write a little prescription and hand it to them and say, go directly to the pharmacy, do not pass go, the pharmacist will immunize you, because that's a much more efficient way to do that. 
That means you don't get the administration fee, but your patients are protected. Influenza. We now know that we don't have to think about influenza immunization, or I should say we don't th have to think about who should be immunized. It's easy because the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has, has said if you're older than six months of age and, and you live in the United States, you should be immunized. I'm asked occasionally something like who should be immunized, and I say when you get your first hundred doses of vaccine in your office, you immunize yourself, your four people who work for you in the office, that leaves 95 doses, you then immunize the next 95 people who walk through the door. It's very simple. Vaccine efficacy, as we all know, this is a good but not perfect vaccine. Vaccine efficacy varies depending on virus match, age, underlying conditions. Overall, 50 to 65 percent effectiveness, and it, if it doesn't prevent the disease completely, it often reduces the severity of the illness, reducing the incidence of pneumonia complication, hospitalization, intensive care unit admission, and dying. So it's a good but not perfect vaccine. I like to quote that old French philosopher Voltaire, waiting for perfection is the great enemy of the current good, so we can still do a lot of good with this imperfect vaccine. Now, it's not, we don't have to think about whom to immunize, everyone, but now we have a variety of influenza vaccine from which to choose, different from the way it was with Henry Ford, who used to say when he introduced his uh, Model T, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. There used to be just kind of inactivated influenza vaccine. We now have a variety of influenza vaccines, so we have to scratch our heads and decide which ones to choose. Inactivated influenza vaccine, the classic injectable vaccine, trivalent, that's the classic vaccine. It protects against two influenza A strains and one influenza B strain. Ah, but now we have quadrivalent influenza vaccine. Each of the manufacturers is changing from trivalent to quad in a gradual fashion over time. They can't change their manufacturing capacity immediately, so they're introducing more quad over time. Probably by next year, not this coming year, but next year there'll be virtually a complete transition. Quad protects against two A strains and two B strains. Hmm. More is better. Of course, you know, for the last several years, we've had high-dose vaccine. Ah, that's still trivalent. It's four times the dose of the conventional influenza vaccine. It's indicated for everyone age 65 and older. And now the data clearly indicate it provides 24 percent better protection against influenza in people age 65 and older than conventional trivalent vaccine. It's, an, it's more of an ouchy vaccine because, after all, it's four times the dose. But nonetheless, it provides better protection. I will say the question I received most frequently last year was, shall I give this person age 65 and older the high dose or the quad? And I suppose one way to do that, <laughs> actually, my suggestion is high dose, because we've demonstrated that it provides better protection against influenza. But I'm not sure that's the right answer. We have an intradermal vaccine, which at the moment continues to be trivalent, indicated for people aged 18 to 65. It's supposed to reduce some of the ouchiness that 
hasn't panned out quite as well as we like, but some people who don't like to be injected deeply. And for sure, although there is a surface kind of irritation and pain, it's not the more muscular irritation that you get from an injectable vaccine. We now have a cell culture vaccine, which continues to be trivalent. It is essentially egg-free. During the manufacturing process, originally the source virus was grown in eggs, but then it's then the manufacturing process is very removed from that original source. You can't measure the amount of egg protein in the vaccine, but the FDA will not allow the manufacturer to call it completely egg-free. Egg free. The manufacturer is actually now petitioning the FDA to let it say that it's egg-free. There's a recombinant vaccine, trivalent, which is egg-free, it is made in a recombinant fashion and is totally free of eggs. And then, of course, as mentioned before, we have live attenuated uh, influenza vaccine. It's totally quadrivalent now. That's the nasal spray vaccine. It's indicated for everyone 2 to 50 who's otherwise, otherwise healthy. So you have an array of vaccines. For what it's worth, and I don't know how much it's, how much it's worth, when uh, the committee at Vanderbilt got together and decided which vaccines our institution was going to purchase, they were purchasing quadrivalent, high dose, some LAIV, particularly for our pediatric population and some adults who just don't like to be inoculated, and a little bit of the recombinant vaccine for our genuinely uh, uh, egg allergic patients. So we have kind of a portfolio of vaccines in our institution. So let's pause for a moment and just walk our way through issues of egg allergy. Recent studies, numerous studies by allergists have indicated that we can be a little bit more aggressive about the use of regular egg-based vaccine in people whom we previously thought couldn't receive vaccine. First question to ask is, can persons eat eggs without reaction? You can give them conventional vaccine, no problem. After eating eggs, does the person get only hives? You could either give them recombinant vaccine or give them inactivated vaccine that's made in eggs and have them sit in your office and watch them for 30 minutes. If they have a more serious reaction, a cardiovascular reaction, respiratory dress, anaphylaxis, if they have that sort of history, give recombinant vaccine or refer them to an allergist. So as regards immunization, be an advocate. Don't make a casual recommendation to your patients about immunizations. Really really make a strong statement, say that it's terribly important for their uh, protection, say that everyone who's one of your patients should have the maximum benefit of the protection that adult immunization can provide today. Review the immunization history of your patients frequently. Stay up to date, watch the annals, the first issue of the annals each year or the second contains the updated adult immunization schedule that Sandy has mentioned each year with a little bit of text that tells you what's been updated because like the rest of life, immunization recommendations continue to change. And as I like to say, when in doubt, immunize. Thank you very much. Sandy? Are you gonna orchestrate the uh, the Q&A here? Okay, if you have any questions, we've got a few minutes, come up to the microphone and we'll try to answer them. Okay, first microphone, right there. So, obviously most of us in our practices have our staff doing finger sticks on many of our patients. I've, I've never obsessed over their technique. Besides just using different lancets, which is fairly obvious, it sounds like you were suggesting there's more to it than that. 
The, uh, the concern is we're not entirely sure why diabetics have a higher rate of hepatitis B infection than do non-diabetics age for age. But that's now well established, substantially so. Some of this must come when in community settings or in some healthcare settings, and we know that hospitals were not meticulous about this for the longest time, glucometers were not optimally disinfected patient to patient. So if you assess the blood glucose concentration in patient A who happened to have chronic hepatitis B infection and you didn't disinfect it and then you did a glucometer measurement on the next patient, obviously you could transfer. But you're changing the lancet, so what is it, what part of the no, device are you disinfecting? Not, not every not every glucometer actually changes the lancer. And the glucometer itself, this, this gets very vague, the glucometer itself, the instrument can be blood infected and the trace amount of hepatitis B virus, it's so infectious, can nonetheless be transmitted from patient to patient. So again, all diabetics under 60 should be immunized with hepatitis B. Diabetics 60 and above may be uh, immunized at the discretion of the physician. Okay, the microphone over there, please. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, the first one is on Zostavax. If someone um, has Zoster, they can get Zostavax within a year. My question is about the value and cost effectiveness uh, since Zoster itself reduces the risk for subsequent um, episodes of Zoster, does it make sense to give it a year or to wait longer than that to get a better bang for your buck? Yeah, thank you, but with respect, people who've had Zoster have an increased risk of a subsequent episode of Zoster. But the recommendation is ec based on expert opinion. There really are no data. And so the ACIP discussion said, if you've had Zoster, you know you have an increased risk, Will the vaccine benefit you? Well, it can't hurt. Wait a year and immunize them. But you're right. After you have the zoster infection, you do have a rise in your antibodies. So that's why you would wait a, you know, a year, or maybe some would even say a little bit longer. But good point. Um, yes, all expert opinion. OK, at this side. Uh, one comment and one question. The comment is that this has become incredibly complicated. And I think there's some ways that we can simplify it. For instance, I shouldn't have to ask my 22-year-old male if he's going to have sex with other males and therefore may need the HPV vaccine, it should just be up to 26. My other uh, com or question is about cost. I really think that, you know, with our keynote speaker talking about cost, I spend all day talking about these things, but at the end of the day, the patient says, how much is it going to cost me and is my insurance company going to pay for it? And even simple vaccines like the flu vaccine this year, when I submitted to Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, I couldn't tell the patient if their plan was going to cover it or not, and I had some that were rejected because of the particular plan that they had. So I just you mean the type of flu vaccine? Even the flu vaccine. If you have well, covered. that is one of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Um, for, you're supposed to have vaccines. They're supposed to be covered. So um, that, that's just not right. And I certainly share your, what, you, uh, what you mentioned about the HPV vaccine for males. Um, when this came up in the discussion, it... Um, the stigma of, of saying you're MSM did come up, and, and it, was, um, it was, to me, it was very worrisome. I, I specifically brought that up. But, um, well, my question really is about, so what's being done when recommendations come out to give these vaccines to try to get these paid for at the same time? Because the recommendations come out, getting them paid for lags way behind, and we counsel our patients, they don't want to pay for them. At the law, the letter of the law now is the Affordable Care Act. Unless you have somebody that has a legacy plan, and those numbers are gonna drop off as we go through the next two to three years. If you have somebody that doesn't have a legacy plan, they have first dollar coverage for all of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations and all of the ACIP recommendations in accord with that recommendation. So if you're doing it off of what ACIP recommends, it's not necessarily going to be covered, but if you're doing it in accord with ACIP recommendations, those should be covered, and it should be across the vast majority of plans now, and over the next couple of years, it should be all plans. 
as long as you're a provider within that plan. If you're a, a, a non-network provider, it might not cover. Okay, over there, other at microphone. Uh, could any of you comment uh, in, in general on the increasing uh, trend that vaccine administration is taking place at the drugstore rather than in the doctor's office? <laughs> oh, boy. I'll let Dr. Schafter comment on that. <laughs> you know, there are <clears throat> literally millions of adults that are unimmunized. Even if we all optimally immunize in our practices, we have to expand the immunization neighborhood. And so I, for one, have welcomed the participation of pharmacists in immunization. What we still have to work on, because we do not have effective adult immunization registries in the vast majority of our states, is the those kinds of registries, so when patients come to see us, whether in the office or in the hospital, or go to the pharmacists, we can look at their immunization history in the registry the way most pediatricians can in most states in this country. I'll tell you a little anecdote. I've always given my daughter her flu vaccine, and so she now lives in Washington. And so I said, honey, just go to the pharmacist. And so she went to the pharmacist, and they gave it to her as she was checking out, standing up. And she says, Mom, blood started pouring down my arm. I'll never go to the pharmacy again to get a flu shot. Oh. So more education is needed. If pharmacists are going to give vaccines, they shouldn't give it to kids when they're checking out, standing up. Okay, back microphone, please. What? Microphone three over there. Okay, microphone three over there. Thank you. I can't I see you. Two separate Sorry. questions, actually. First one is that you might have touched on a little bit with the MMR vaccine. A patient with uh, received the primary series of MMR gets tested as an adult going back to school for the, uh, with titers, and at least one of the three components is uh, non-immune. Do you give one booster, two boosters, 30 days apart, and you need to recheck titers? And my second question is totally different required, uh, regarding the uh, shingles vaccine. Do you recommend shingles vaccine in your older patients, uh, older over age 75 with decreased efficacy of both uh, uh, shingles and the uh, post-herpetic neuralgia? Two separate questions. Thank you. Well, on the MMR question, if they've had two doses of vaccine and they've got a record, then they probably don't need to have either a titer or a repeat dose of the vaccine. If no records. They're no records. No records. If they don't have records, then the choice is going to be either you do titers of uh, measles and rubella or you get a total vaccine series of two doses if you don't have antibodies that are positive. And if you look at the footnotes, it tells you specifically what to do, you know, um, how many doses you need depending upon which um, component, if you do the titers, they're, it's, that they're not immune to. So look at, it's um, footnote number seven. Do you need to recheck the titers after the second booster? No. No. Okay. no. And on the Zoster vaccine, there's only a recommendation for one dose of vaccine. There's not a recommendation for boosters at any time. And that's the big thing. Remember, he said, um, Dr. Schaffner said, it's FDA approved starting at 50. And originally, ACIP started the 60 recommendation because there was a shortage of the material to make the chickenpox vaccine. And, but then, when there was no longer a shortage, that's when they looked at the data and found it was more cost effective to give it later. Now, in my practice, I have patients that are in their 50s and are working. They don't want to get shingles. And so I do give it to them. I warn them that since this is not an ACIP recommendation, it may not be covered by their insurance. And I also tell them about that decrease, that immunization, the uh, immunity decreasing as time uh, goes on and that you know, at some time in the future they might need uh, a booster. We, we don't have that information yet. I'm talking okay. about the 85-year-old uh, that comes in for their uh, first yeah, you 85-year-old, uh, definitely give that patient um, a shingles vaccine. Efficacy. Definitely, definitely. Okay, in the back. Uh, yes, as regards Tdap, I'm six months back order. Is there a reason and what can I do about it or any suggestions? It's getting better, they tell us. Sorry about that. At every ACIP meeting, there's actually a little time spent talking about vaccine shortages, and so this is kind of brought out in the open, but definitely a frustration. Um, um, I'm sorry. I mean, we don't have any control over that, but um, it shouldn't be. Okay, front microphone, please. How do I get my uh, multi-specialty group to purchase a high-dose flu shot when they say there's no 
uh, published uh, peer review data and uh, official recommendation is not for the high dose. I'm sorry, what, what was the last? I, I, didn't get the I didn't get the question either. The last part of this, something about the high dose flu vaccine. Well, there's no, the official recommendation is not for high dose and uh, it's not uh, peer reviewed published data right now. Ah. Well, the, the. My group is reluctant to uh, purchase it because of that. They wanted outcome studies. And yeah. Uh, my understanding is that the publications are in process. The presentations have been, were made very, very clearly to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And I believe you can still, Sandy, you're better at this than I am. You can go into the ACIP website and go back and look at those presentations of the data of the enhanced uh, effectiveness of uh, high-dose flu vaccines. Yes. The, at one of the ACIP meetings, the um, company actually pre pre presented some data that compared the high-dose flu vaccine to the standard flu vaccine flu zone. It was by Santa Fe. Santa Fe, I believe, makes that. And they did show it was like, you know, 25 percent, I think it was 25 percent more effective um, in seniors. But your question is you don't, you don't know if it's going to be covered or... Um, well, I, I, I think I think Medicare does cover the oh, the, the, the high dose. Covers, now, Medicare I, covers high dose. I'm sure that since it's so much more expensive, it's twice as expensive. They they'd love to have a reason not to cover that, but so far they are covering it. But you have to you know show that it's a high dose. You ha it has to be um, coded differently. Um, I think I think we're, we we've got to go. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we'll be in the back of the room if you have any more questions, but thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. When in doubt,